You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 66. 66 we of are, the Common Descent Podcast. We are getting up there. And with episode 66, to go along with this weird number, we're talking about elephants, obviously. Of course. That, that's the animal I think of when I think of 66. Elephants it, are so weird and fascinating. So it kind of almost fits. <laughs> more accurately, proboscideans. We're talking about more than just elephants. And we'll go over what I mean by that in a bit. But this episode was requested in many ways, which will start to explain this. <laughs> this is a very cool topic with a lot of categories. And we had almost every part of the topic we're going to cover this episode requested, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, it was a very thorough request list. <laughs> yes, it was. So we had requests for proboscideans, proboscidean evolution, elephants, mammoths, mastodons, gompotheres, ancient elephants, and <laughs> just proboscidea. So, yeah. So we're going to do all that. We're going to do all of that and a little bit more. <laughs> our requesters include some of our patrons, Brooke, Thomas, and Lydia, as well as my co my previous co-worker, Sheldon, Jake, Jonathan, Nick, and the survey again. Oh, survey again. We know that that person. Survey. You just keep coming through. This That makes this one of the most requested episodes. I don't think that's quite as many as we had for turtles. I no. think there were like 10 requests yeah. for turtles or something. But this one has been building and this one's been cool because people have had particular parts of it that they were yeah. a little more interested in which is cool i'm not surprised elephants are this fascinating group of animals if they're just so different they're so weird and they have only been weirder in oh, yeah. the past <laughs> which we're going to we're going to take a look so for this episode we're going to talk about what is an elephant what is a proboscidean what does that mean what are today's elephants we're going to go over a, a very brief overlook of their evolutionary history because they're a really diverse group surprisingly com since they aren't diverse nowadays and then we're going to kind of take some snapshots we're going to go through and look at some of the major groups of proboscidean throughout time and talk a little bit about what made them stand out and why they were weird and different and how we still don't know what most of them were doing. <laughs> As mammals go, elephants are pretty cool. They're pretty awesome. But before any of that, some quick announcements. Speaking of patrons, we had some requests, but we also have some new patrons to shout names out for. Ah, uh, yes. Because when you sign up for our Patreon at a certain level, you get the wonderful opportunity to hear us say your name on the podcast like this so welcome gino eric and talen welcome and thank you thanks for the patronage and thanks to all of our other patrons always speaking of patreon a reminder that we have some new or recently kind of new bonuses that are going up there we are still doing the bonus newses yeah so if you like the news section and you want to hear some more news extra news make sure if you're on patreon check it out you want to go see it go to patreon we also will take patron questions and answer them on the podcast listen to the end of this episode for one and keep requesting questions because our our cup runneth low yeah we have been working our way diligently through the patron questions and we're we're getting through the list so patrons of of the level that request guys questions send them on in we submit a challenge to you yes stump us <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna regret that. I was about to say, <laughs> we need a more difficult challenge. <laughs> and then the final announcement coming at the end of August, beginning of September, we will be returning a, a triumphant return. Yes, to Dragon Con. Dragon Con in Atlanta. We will be heading back there. We are both going to be on a slew of panels this time. Yep. We're still getting the, we're still getting the finalized schedule. So we will. Make sure to announce that when we have the last, last draft of the schedule. But we are going to be on at least three or four different panels mm -hmm. and we'll be all around the con. So if you're there, hopefully we'll get to see you. We're going to be on panels about paleontology because that's our shtick. At least one panel about speculative evolution, which Ooh. is also one of our shticks. We really like that. 
and some others were going to be up on the panels with some real... I'm very excited by some of the other names that I'm seeing on these panels. Again, not finalized yet, but stick around. Probably next couple episodes we'll have the finalized list. Absolutely. So if you're going to be in Atlanta around the turn of the month, August to September, come say hi. Yeah. And with that, our announcements draw to a close, which brings us to our news section. Every episode, we like to go over just a little bit of the recent science paleo evolutionary news that has come out on that there interwebs and share it with you all. And I'm going to let David do the first sharing. I'm going to begin with a weird one. Oh boy. Normally I put my weirder one second. Yeah. But I get to go first this time. <laughs> this is a study that discovered evidence of ancient meteorite impact in clams. Okay. Listen up. <laughs> this is research by Mike Meyer et al. in the journal, the delightfully named journal that I'd never heard of before. Meteoritics and Planetary Science. Ooh. Yeah. And we'll link to a news page on the Florida Museum website by Natalie Van Hoos. In Florida, Sarasota County, Florida, there is a famous area of shell beds, fossil shell beds. So this is, you know, imagine a shell bed that you have a section like of shallow ocean. One they sleep in, but like where they're living where and growing. Where Ariel sleeps. Yes. <laughs> uh, shell bed. <laughs> but you have this like reef almost, this sort of bed of clams and stuff. Yes. Of shelled organisms. This is like those, those those oyster reefs we talked about. Yeah. There are famous shell bed deposits from the Pliopleistocene, Pliocene into Pleistocene, so a couple million years ago, that include lots and lots of fossil clams. An interesting thing that allowed this research to happen that I didn't realize is that when clams die, what will often happen during the fossilization process is that sediments will fill in the shell. Mm-hmm. And then the pressure of the overlying sediment will hold the shell shut. And the shell just holds whatever got in there <laughs> and can preserve it. So the article, the, the main author not, uh, notes that sometimes you can find whole like fish skeletons or other small animals preserved inside clamshells. Oh, that's awesome. Because they're hold their little sediment capsules. That's perfect. Which is super cool. I didn't know that. It's it's like the little the ring holders just it's just been holding yes yeah. waiting for the right time, <laughs> so that's plus one for bivalves. With apologies <laughs> to Alicia, this particular study began way back in 2006 when the lead author of the study Meyer was one of the students doing a study a project looking through the sediment in a bunch of these clams not for fish and stuff but for forams. Cool. So as we've discussed in the past, particularly in the, our second spotlight episode with Adrian, foraminifera are tiny planktonic shelled organisms that paleontologists love because they track all sorts of cool things like ocean chemistry and ancient temperatures. Yes. A lot of ecosystem information in forams. So they were collecting these fossil clams, prying them open, and then sieving through the sediment inside the clams. While looking for forams, Mike Meyer notes that he found a total of 83 tiny glassy spheres. Ooh. Now, tiny, I mean, they are approximately 200 micrometers in diameter. Wow. That's very, very small. Little tiny silica-rich microspherules. And they look like, you know, they're translucent. There are some pictures of them in the article. For years, they report... They didn't know what these were until more recently with this new paper. The authors analyzed the spherules, both their physical traits and their chemical compositions, and found that they match what are called microtectites, Ooh. which are little balls of glass that you often find produced by meteorite impacts. Very interesting. This is exciting because meteorite impacts. Hooray. That's always a uh, exciting find. But they're interesting for several reasons. Number one, this is the first report of tiny silica-rich microspherules from the state of Florida. Wow. Yep, that's pretty cool. They are a good match for microtectites, for, for meteorite impact productions, but they have an unusually high amount of sodium in them, which suggests that something is different about them. The authors point out that there are lots of salty rock, like bedrocks, in Florida. 
So it may be that during the creation of the, during the impact, salt was incorporated into the little spheres. Yeah, that was the rock that was exploded. They also found them on four different depositional layers, which could be that the the little spheres were deposited in a different area and then that was eroded away over multiple episodes so that there was an impact, deposited a bunch of these little spheres, and then that dep- deposited area was eroded away several times yeah, and er- brought the sediment into these clams. Er- eroded and then preserved and then eroded and preserved yep. eroded and preserved. Or multiple impacts. Yeah. Each producing different things. The other thing that's really interesting that they point out is there is no known impacts that quite match the time and composition and region. So this could be evidence of previously unknown impacts in the Gulf area. Wow. Which is pretty cool. That's very cool. That's a lot of implications for something like this because, I mean, we've mentioned impacts and how they affect fossil ecosystems many, many, many times on the podcast. But it, if suddenly you discover that there was an impact you had been overlooking, it could suddenly slot into other weird patterns that might have been harder to answer before knowing that a rock hit us from space at that time. Yeah, and indeed, they point out that they found these when they were doing this original research and didn't know what they were, and so they set them aside. There could very well be lots more of these. Yes. And they actually point, the the paper actually makes a comment where they say, there's a lot of fossil clams in Florida. (laughs) There could be more cool stuff hiding inside them. It's like what we say at the museum when people are like, well, how do you not know that there are aren't other sites like this around here? We don't. Nope. <laughs> All these other hills could have another gray fossil site under them. Yep. We just have to build a road through them. You start cr- prying open clams. Yep. Find so just more. <laughs> grab, grab your butter knife. <laughs> head on down. <laughs> Dunk. So, yeah. That's really cool. I thought that was... I like research that not only is news because it's news... But I learn a new thing mm-hmm. that I didn't know. I didn't know you find cool stuff inside fossil clams. No, I mean, it makes sense. Yep, but I believe I, it. I would have just always assumed that the sediment inside the clam would be very similar to what it was preserved in. You know, that it, it would have just been same, same. Uh, but it makes sense that they can act as a little capsule. Yeah. Other stuff gets in there. Mm-hmm. And that's really cool. So it's a cool spot to discover something like this. And then it's a cool discovery. <laughs> yeah. That's all around fun stuff. Nice. Very cool. Well, my first bit of news is a little bit more on the recognizable side. We've talked about this group before, but not this individual animal. I have some news to discuss about an ancient bird preserved in some amber Ooh. from Myanmar. Yep. And it is in another in Antiornithine. Hey, we talked about those a few times. Yes. This one's a little weird, though. This is research by Li Shing et al. in Current Biology. And the article we're linking to is in Nat Geo by Michael Greshko. So this is a specimen found in a fairly small piece of amber. They said just six grams. Oh. So not big. This yeah. is This is itty bitty. Dating back to about 99 million years ago, as this amber tends to do. Yep. Late Cretaceous. And it is a little bird foot. Cool. And it is preserved well enough for them to identi- to have identified it as a new species, Elector Ornis Chenguangai. And it would resemble a modern sparrow, so it's not something that looks crazy, crazy different. All right, little bird. Yeah, little bird. But as we've discussed before, in Antiornithines are a major separate branch Absolutely. from modern bird. This is what birds were. This is the, the dominant group of birds in the Cretaceous. So this was what almost were today's birds and then didn't didn't keep up their their winning streak yeah <laughs> <laughs> so these were a little bit different uh many of them had the the toothy mouths and did not have that full beak which becomes important with this new individual because this foot this preserved bit of bird has some weird toes particularly one very very long middle toe interesting so three toes like- yep like theropods have. Yep. And there's a long... Interesting. So that it one toe is significantly longer than the others. And they emphasize that this is a particularly bizarre feature among birds living and dead. Hmm. They, the article makes note that 
even dis- as they put it, quote, in the, the National Geographic article, despite the fact that we have between 9,000 and 18,000 species of bird, this is still unique. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. So this is a weird foot. They gave a, a, a metric to give you an idea so that you can kind of picture it yourself. If the human hand had the same proportion of this foot, your middle finger would be about 60% longer than your index finger. Wow. So it would be more than half again as long as your index finger. So like the distance from my wrist (laughs) to the knuckle again. Yeah. On top of the middle. Weird. So you would have just had like half a hand length sticking off (laughs) from the tip of your palm, uh, from the tip of your fingers. And it's just that one toe. Now what this bird was using that toe for, we don't know. No. It's too weird. (laughs) <laughs> well, there's nothing. It sounds like there's nothing good to compare it to. There's nothing within birds to compare it to, so they're they're they had to kind of reach out a little bit farther to get some ideas as to what it could have. We don't know this is what it was, but could have been doing. One of the clues that gave them a little bit of help is the foot was preserved well enough. Now it was still had some damage. They you could actually evidently see the skin coming off of the bone in oh, the amber. Weird. It was like sloughing off. Ooh, so it was probably decomposing yes. when it was captured in amber. Is what it sounds like. Cool. But it was preserved well enough to still have some of the surrounding feathers and skin on the foot, including some special scales called scutellate scale filaments, which are these long, thin ones similar-ish to whiskers. Interesting. And these are known in birds to help with detecting st- stuff like flying insects as well as wind and airflow changes. So it these are sensory in nature if these are of the same uh, um if these are of the same purpose. Right. For right. this ancient bird. That being the case, it suggests this toe would have been very sensitive. Interesting. So maybe it was used for probing at bark and getting to Little little bits of food, grubs perhaps, underneath the bark, kind of like an eye-eye. That was my first thought. Yep. That I've been waiting the whole time. I've been sitting here going, reminds me of an eye-eye. Yep. Yep, because the eye, for those who don't know, an eye-eye is a little primate that has this one long finger, and they tap on... Also its middle finger. The wood, also the middle finger. Tap, tap, tap. And then they reach into, like, bug holes and scoop out bugs. And it's, just, it's a long, hooked finger, you know, with a little hooked claw so that they can probe in and fish stuff out this could be a bird that has a similar feature to its foot that's so cool now was it doing this it's hard to say right but it could be another final cool note for it this is the first genus of bird described from a fossil encased in amber oh that's neat yeah so even with the rotting foot it was enough for them to describe a genus cool yeah it also is interesting to me that a bird would develop its foot to do that instead of its beak. And that was one of the notes they made is because this group doesn't have the same derived beak face right, that right. modern birds have, making a hooked probing beak would have been maybe not as possible. And, which would also explain why of our eight to 18,000 species of modern birds, we have not seen this feature. Yes. When you have this awesome cuticle covered beak that you can put into stuff why use your feet for that but if you have a little mouthy a little toothy dinosaur face you know uh non-avian dinosaur face (laughs) then it's harder to peck at the wood maybe interesting so still this is still very much initial hypotheses mostly conjecture and propositions for answers They'd have to do actual dedicated research on the, the the features of that toe to really get some answers for what it might be doing. Weird feature. I like weird features that are so weird we don't know what they are. I That is one of my favorites to tell people about. This animal, we don't know what it's doing. Why? Because it's so weird. So weird. Hey, elephants later. Yes. <laughs> <We'll be> t- <laughs> You'll get used to that phrase really, really quick. <laughs> well, my second bit of news is about humans. Which we talk about sometimes on the podcast. I talk to them. Some of my best friends are humans. (laughs) This research reports the discovery of what appears to be a fragment of Homo sapiens in a place and a time 
that are not only surprising, but change the story of what we understand how our species got around the planet. Oh, good. I was waiting for it to be updated. Yeah. So, and, and you know, stop me if that sounds familiar. <laughs> we are always discovering new human remains, and we go, oh, apparently they were here. <laughs> this is research by Katerina Harvati et al. in the Journal of Nature, and we will post to an article by Ed Young in the Atlantic. In southern Greece, there is a cave called Apidema, or however it's pronounced correctly. In that cave way back in the 70s, two partial hominin skulls so episode 18 hominins are the human lineage us and our extinct relatives two partial hominin skulls were discovered one that is sort of a distorted uh, uh partial skull the other one is a chunk of the left side of the brain case cool they were found very close together and assumed to be the same species assumed to be from the same time but it was always difficult because of the nature of them to actually assess those things yeah Neanderthal was the identification. People had looked at the more complete of them. Neanderthal would make sense. But this research has finally gotten both of them together and not uh, and done shape analysis. They virtually reconstructed the skulls. Nice. Based on what they have, what would the rest of the skull look like? And compare that with other hominins. And they managed to get dates using uranium dating on the rock, the, the rocky sediment in which they were preserved. Nice. What they found will surprise you. <laughs> the second skull, Apidema 2, the one... The, I like the uh, uh, Ed Young's article. In, in the article, it describes it as the one with the face. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a mean friends yeah, talking yeah, about... You with the face. Talking about someone who just walked into the party. No, no, yeah. no, the one with the face. Why don't you navigate yourself to the back of the line and stand there with your shirt? <laughs> the morphological analysis determined that it is very Neanderthal-like, as expected. The dating determined that it is around 170,000 years old. Greece, Neanderthals, no big deal. Yes. The other one, Apidema 1, which is the left half of the brain case, has a skull much more like modern humans, like Homo sapiens, our species, a little different, but closest to Homo sapiens, and dates to around 210,000 years ago. Wow. This is surprising <laughs> for several reasons. First, because that is, if that date's correct, the oldest Homo sapiens fossil outside of Africa. It predate, There was one in Israel that's around 180,000. So this is 30,000 years older than the previous record holder. Nice. Which suggests that they got out of Africa earlier, which is cool. It's also the oldest Homo sapiens in Europe. Ooh. By 170,000 years. Wow. Which suggests that humans got to Europe way earlier than we thought. In fact, the classic tale, right, the classic story, and we may even have said this in our episode 18, is that humans showed, Homo sapiens shows up in Africa, gets around Asia and, and, and some of the southern Pacific areas gradually, while Neanderthals were in Europe, and eventually humans moved in and eventually push the Neanderthals out. Yes. This suggests that this was a place where humans and Neanderthals both lived, in the case of these skulls, Homo sapiens before Neanderthal. Oh. Because the Homo sapiens skull is older than the Neanderthal skull. True. So there might be a much more complex history of the two species moving in and out of places the fact that the Homo sapiens skull is a little bit of an odd shape makes some wonder if it was uh, the product of interbreeding between mm -hmm. Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. But others have pointed out that our understanding of the genetic history of the two species suggests that they weren't like living alongside each other and interbreeding for very long stretches of time. That it was occasional, but it wasn't like for many, many, many generations you just had them mixing together that doesn't look like what happened yes so if this was the product of interbreeding it may have been a rare example it may have just been an earlier european human shape who knows what the authors are hoping somebody will do maybe them maybe somebody else is get dna yeah dna that, from these two specimens would be real nice i would tell you a bunch but even just with the morphology even just with this little fragment of brain case which is a unique shape the brain case is very uniquely shaped in homo sapiens this 
is a huge <laughs> if the ID holds up and if the dates hold up, which everyone cited in the article seems pretty confident about it. That's there's another kink in our story of how humans got out of Africa. It really is fascinating how how much of that puzzle we have and to what degree we are filling in and adjusting dates and movements and interactions because that's like the way we have information on our, our lineage's history is like going through the the previous tenants of an apartment like just mm -hmm. constant and then this person moved in and then this person moved out and it's so detailed it's just insane well it's a lot like looking at your family genealogy yes it is it's like oh and then great uncle such and such's wife moved to italy yeah you know we were where well, we were from germany and then we moved out and then went back yeah and so that's why it's weird this one family moved over to that country and stayed there for a while and then they came back and it because it's very much the same mm -hmm. right different branches of our family tree moving from place to place it's like it's so cool as we said in episode 18 it's fascinating how much detail we know about our own species history and it's fascinating how much we are oblivious to yeah without the discoveries of the future yes it's oh so stay tuned for more human news yep we will rewrite this later may i'll uh, make a whole new podcast <laughs> we won't do that no. humans aren't cool enough no <laughs> we got rid of our tails you lost you lost me <laughs> hey, I no know tails I've, no hand feet i know i've said both of those but no no so what's your last news article about mine is about early humans <laughs> <laughs> All right, just one more. <laughs> just just one more. This one's weird, so <laughs> so I had to. So this this is about some early early human ancestors and uh, a really interesting analysis. So this is research by Renau Joan Boyau et al. in Nature, and the article is by the same, but in the conversation. Yeah, conversation is a website where uh, researchers get to write articles about their own papers, which is Indeed. pretty cool. Indeed. This is a study focusing on Australopithecus africanus. So they date back to southern Africa between two to three million years ago. Yeah. So also stratigraphically not too old, but... Right, right. These are early hominins, mm -hmm. some of the earliest of our ancestors to stand erect-ish, to be more human-shaped, but not quite human -y just yet. These are the ones that you typically, when you see documentaries, look very much like a chimpanzee, but walking like a person. Yeah. Lucy. Yes. Is Lucy. it uh, Ashul Pitsin? So they were studying specifically two individuals, and they had fossil teeth from these individuals that they wanted to study to look at how the diets early in life were affected. And... Part of the reason they're able to do this is because while your bones continue to change their composition throughout your life, so your bones are only ever so old. You replace your skeleton yeah. during your life. If old bone gets dissolved away by enzymes and new bone is grown in. So your bones are constantly updating. Our skeleton is always fairly new. Yeah, new patches. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, like new, but it's still used. <laughs> your teeth don't do that. No. Your teeth, once they grow in, kind of lock in, which means they can actually lock in lock in the growth that happened during childhood. And they called it, they, they relate it to like being a capsule, very much like our like our bivalves earlier. Yeah. It encapsulates early uh, ontogeny of the skeleton, which means it's incorporating things from what you're eating yeah, or what you eat. The chemical signature of your mm -hmm. food is being stored within there. It's, we've talked about this before that, that, you know, typically isotope analysis, they used a little bit different here, some updated techniques. They used a laser to zap tiny pieces off the teeth and use an instrument called a mass spectrometer. So instead of doing our typical grind it up method, this is taking smaller samples and then looking at the different spectrum of light that comes off of that sample when it is vaporized. Yeah. And that tells you what's in it. That's cool. And this also lets them take from a wider surface of the tooth by while being less destructive. Yeah. So very nice to the fossil. Spot sampling. And what this does is it gives them an idea of the diet and how it changed 
through that early life. Interesting. This is cool because you get a lot of these on, you know, I always read about these on, you know, bison and and, and dinosaurs and here's isotopes. I, rarely do I read them, at least, I'm sure they've been done, on hominins. Yeah, and boy, do we find something interesting. So the analysis of the four teeth from the two individuals shows that the infants, shows that as infants, they were breastfed as mammals are like to do, Mm -hmm. up to about six to nine months old exclusively. So just breastfeeding up to at, at, at max nine months old. And then supplementally breastfed up to five to six years old whilst introducing solid foods. Interesting. Yeah, so they did not just stop breastfeeding at infancy. It becomes a tool to supplement while they start eating normal food. Interesting. That's cool. What a cool level of detail to know. They also were able to see that the balance between milk and solid food was cyclical, meaning it cycled and was probably response to seasonal changes. Breastfeeding when food was rare and solid food when food wasn't. Wow. Yeah. Now this gives lots of potential insights into how Australopithecus and maybe other Australopithecines lived and functioned. They also looked at modern animals from similar savanna biomes Mm -hmm. to see how their teeth matched with a a seasonal, matched with the seasons that they might have been experiencing there, and they showed a similar cyclical signal. So it seems like it likely was seasonal. Wow, like wet season, dry season out in the savanna. And they see a very similar one in modern orangutans. I was going to ask about modern apes. Yes, so they do see some similarities there. But they point out that feeding for so much of the childhood, breastfeeding, is very expensive for the mother. Yeah. I mean, she needs to be producing milk that whole time, which means she has to be getting enough food to do that. And they said that this could be one of the potential pressures that eventually caused them to go extinct. This was an expensive way to raise Hmm. a child and less efficient, maybe, than others who survived. I also like that this gives us insight into their family behavior. Yes. Like we always, I I mean, we always kind of assume that they are living in family groups because modern primates often do that. Modern apes do that. But that there is that close connection between mother and offspring for years. Yes. That's fascinating to know. It's a very long childhood when you compare it to other animals, but even other primates. Yeah. So it's, it's very, it could very easily shift how we portray that dynamic which i once again those those cool insights into the daily life i love very cool and with that we have newsed ourselves out which means we can get on to our main topic now once again today's episode is all about proboscideans those tusked and trunked for the most part individuals that nowadays are some of the biggest animals that we've seen in recent history, but have been all sorts of different shapes before the modern day. After the break, we will look into what defines this group and a brief overview of their evolutionary history. So stay tuned. So proboscideans are a very interesting group, partially just because of how we think about them. Because nowadays, when I say proboscideans, I only mean elephants. Yep. Because that's all there are now. And there's not many. So (laughs) when we say elephant and proboscidean, everyone has one image with slight variation depending on which side of the equator you're on. Yes. But as a taxonomic group, it's actually much more diverse fossil-wise and has a very interesting history when you go back to its origins. This is a classic example of a group whose modern diversity is not a good representation of their past diversity. Yes. Which makes for some interesting and difficult interpretations for the fossil members. But first off, what is... A proboscidean. Proboscidea is an order of eutherian mammals. That's the one that includes us placentals. Yeah. And it includes elephants and all of their closest relatives. 
most of which are tusked and trunked. Yes, they have big teeth that are tusks. Yeah, those ivory incisors. And they have a long prehensile trunk. Nose lip. And that's how the group gets its name. Probosidia is for proboscis. Yep. The Latin for nose. Schnoz. And so they are the schnozzed group of mammals. <laughs> <laughs> and they are... That, that is actually a fairly consistent trait, as far as we can tell, throughout most of the group. Now, where do they fall within the mammal tree? It's a little weird. They, they have definitely shifted around throughout history, but nowadays, they are within the superorder Afrotheria, which is a weird group, because this is a group that means you're from Africa. Yes. <laughs> so this is the group of animals that originated and live in Africa. Yep. A Gondwanan yes. group, to use the archaic, well, not ar but the more ancient word, I should say. Yes, absolutely. So this puts them, this is why sometimes you'll see them compared to aardvarks and other animals like that, because they are in a general group with them, but they're close relatives in that branch, in that super order. The closest animals uh, on the Tree of Life are Cyrenians, so dugongs and manatees, and the mountain hyrax. Yeah, which is a small, like, you could mistake it if you saw it in North America for, like, a rodent, like a big oh, yeah. rodent, like a prairie dog or kind of thing. It looks kind of thing. like a short-eared rabbit. It's very long-legged. It runs up and down hilly slopes and is very, yeah, rodent logomorph-esque but actually closely related to elephants, as are the big water potatoes, <laughs> dugongs and manatees. The manatee! The manatee! So, they're in a weird group. Uh, they're in the clade Hainangulata. The closest of those are the manatees and the elephants, or the, man the Cyrenians and the elephants. And that you can actually see that, and they have that very similar dentition. Yeah, their teeth do that weird thing. They don't look the same, but they act the same way. Yeah. And we'll get into that in just a moment. So let's go over some of the physical characteristics that we know for our modern representatives, which are elephants. So what features does an elephant have? We already talked about two of them, the trunk and the tusks. Trunks are a specialized fusion of the upper lip and the nose. I love that they always call it a fusion, and it's very apt because in uh, embryos, it's not fused. Yeah. So it actually does fuse during development, which I... a little I, nose. Yeah. It's really cool. This is a long, muscular, no bones in it part of the body. This is why ancient elephant skulls uh, were thought to be cyclops skulls, because the big nasal opening, the big nose hole, is in the center of the skull, and there's nothing attaching to it bony-wise. So it's just this giant tube of muscle. It's two paired muscles that can have... Up to, and I've seen numbers that go higher than this, but up to 100,000 individual muscle fiber bundles. It is so dexterous, it can match the dexterity of a human hand and allows them to grab food, pick up individual pieces of food, but also they can feed themselves water. They can carry water up to their mouth. It's a, a multi-purpose tool. It is one of the most dynamic tools that I can think of in the animal kingdom. It, the example that I always used to see on documentaries is they would show an elephant picking up an egg. Yes. They pick up an egg with their trunk very delicately, and then the next clip would be them pushing a tree over. Well, and that's that's the thing I love. It's the way I see it is it's like one of those infomercials where it's like you could have a rake and a shovel and a <laughs> you know a hoe. Why not use our garden buddy? It's like that. Do you want a grabber that physically handicapped people use to pick stuff up? Do you want a bulldozer to pull over a tree? <laughs> Do you want a fire hose to carry water? Do you want a periscope to breathe a snorkel whilst you swim between islands? Get a trunk. Yeah, it's like it's the quadruped's answer to the primate hand. Yep. And arguably even more capable yeah my hand can't shoot water i can't i have to make a thing to carry water <laughs> so the trunks are so like they're just an incredible and unique like 
nothing else. There are, like, tapers have a little yeah. trunky lip. Elephant shrews have their little yeah. lippy thing. Manatees yes. have sort of a mobile upper lip. They have, they have a, and they, are, they have a giant nasal passage for all that muscle. But, oh my, but there is nothing like an elephant's trunk. No one's leaned into it and just taken it to the logical conclusion yep. elephant early elephants looked around at their relatives and said no one's gonna no one's gonna take the next step here all right it's us then so the other thing that really sets elephants apart is their teeth so we all know the tusk tusk is the famous thing about elephants tusks are those long pieces of ivory and we call it ivory because it does grow differently than yeah. your typical tooth it has actually if you cut it open it looks kind of like a tree it's very ringed and it's it's got a geometric shape to it. Yeah, they grow in these sort of chevron shapes that are very diagnostic when you're studying fossils. Absolutely. You can tell a chunk of tusk from a chunk of tooth very easily yes. if you know what to look for. And the tusks are teeth. Yes, they so, are the incisors. And so the front, you know, if you look at your, you know, your two front teeth, like that song, <laughs> in, you have, there's more than just the two. But it is the upper, the frontmost teeth have developed into these two ivory tusks. And so basically the teeth have just ratcheted forward and grown out of the mouth to become multi-tools once again. So it's kind of, it extrudes from the mouth like sort of a saber tooth yeah. cat, except that that's a canine, so it's more like a narwhal. Yes, it is. <laughs> Incisors, then forward. And so they have the tusks. Fun fact on the tusks. Elephants do tend, modern elephants at least, to be left or right tusked. Yeah. And they prefer one. And you can tell because that one's worn down from them digging and pushing on stuff and sharpening that tusk more often than others. Yeah, they'll use their tusks to scrape bark off yep. of trees sometimes. And so, very interesting. They don't have many other teeth other than the incisors. They have typically 12 deciduous, so baby premolars and then 12 molars and that's it they got rid of the canines and they got rid of all the other incisors they are polyphyodonts which means they continuously replace teeth so this is like sharks crocodiles are also considered to fall into this group of continuous replacement we would be diphyodont which is you get two you right. only get two so we get baby teeth and adult teeth they do it differently yes so now elephants, as they replace their teeth, are not infinite. They have a set cycle they go through. Right. And so, like I said, 12 molars. Not infinite, but they replace them throughout their life. So that's how these teeth are working. Uh, so it's not like a shark where it's just lose teeth, grow teeth, lose teeth, grow teeth. It's you have a certain amount in your mouth. If you lose one, you get a new one for a while. And even more set than that. They actually have very set patterns for when they lose teeth and when the new teeth come in. So much so that depending on what molar a elephant is on, you can judge its age. Yeah, which is handy in the fossil record. Yes, it is. So they have these sections, which means that by the time they've gotten to the six molar paired, so that's why it's 12, once they've gotten to the six set, that's their last set. And it has to last them the rest of their life. By which we mean when it wears out, they starve to death. Yep. So if they live past that set, in human care, that can be extended because we feed them mushy food. Yeah. But in the wild, they typically are done after that, which is going to usually be past 40 into the 60s, most potentially. Last quick note about interesting elephant features is their feet. Features. Features. Interesting elephant features. They are tiptoe walkers so they are digitigrade like most mammals so they're toe walker not tiptoe like a ballerina like horses yes but like your cat yes like your cat so they're walking on their tiptoes and that may seem weird because if you think of looking at an elephant right now they look like they're just walking on a flat foot yeah a big pillar a big pillar and the reason for that is behind those toes is a big cushion yeah. A big squishy cushion, which widens the foot as they put weight on it and helps distribute their massive weight. But not just that, they have a sixth toe, but not actually a toe. <laughs> it's the same kind of sixth digit that 
giant pandas have, that sesamoid, so that part of the wrist that has grown out to act kind of like a digit, that's how giant pandas are able to grab bamboo. So they have a fake thumb in their palm. Yep. Sesamoids are the pieces of bone uh, that form in between the ligaments, like in your hand and like the kneecap, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, they're sort of extra bones that end, that show up at joints sometimes. Exactly. And they, they fill in the joint and help where needed. They are pretty diverse. This one has grown out to help distribute the weight even further. So they have a sixth false toe that is helping cushion them even more, which means elephants are actually very quiet when they walk around. They are very good at distributing their weight. They don't have a boom, boom. They actually are very stealthy, very delicate walkers. Yeah, elephants have all these adaptations in their legs and feet for being gigantic. In fact, a lot of the time when we're studying, when paleontologists look at dinosaurs and such, yes. and they want to understand how giant animals of the past moved, they look at elephants. Because an elephant's leg is not like any other animal's leg. Because that leg has to, those four legs have to hold up five, six, nine, ten tons of weight. Yes. And so they have become very good at being so big. Nowadays, we only have a few, though, to look at. So we don't, like we said earlier, don't have a wide sample size. And there are two main groups, the Asian and the African elephants. Yep. Elphus in Asia, Loxodonta in Africa. Within those, we have three species and a few subspecies. So we, right, right. we have a very small modern diversity of elephants so the african elephants loxodonta are known throughout africa below the sahara they used to be much more diverse now they're patchy populations because of reasons named humans and there are two species here you have the african bush elephant which is typically what people are talking about when they talk about Elephants in general, actually. Usually when you hear elephant, this is what they're usually referring to. But it's definitely what they're referring to when they say African elephant. Yeah. Is the African bush or African savanna elephant, which is the largest species of elephant, which means it's also the largest land mammal and land animal alive today. Yeah, which is a pretty cool claim to fame. Oh, it is. And they're they're pretty big. Uh, max sizes, uh, the records get up to 13 feet tall at the shoulder. So these are... Big animals. These are the big-eared, long-tusked elephants. Then you have the African forest elephant. It's the smaller of the two. It's right. actually the smallest elephant alive today. Tiny. Which is... Positively so tiny. So weird. It's <laughs> both the ones in Africa took the two extremes. So yep. we have Loxodonta africana, africana, which is our bush, and then Loxodonta cyclotus, which is our forest the forest only gets up to be like seven feet tall at the shoulder. Yeah. So minuscule. I'd basically be, I die with it. <laughs> it as almost... it throws me across the forest. <laughs> the African elephant, like I said, has the features you think of with elephants. Big ears, long tusks. Both males and females have the tusks. So it's just tusks all around. They are low domed head. So they don't have that extra little bump that you'll see in the Asian elephants and in some fossil groups. And then one of the weird features is that their trunks are different than the Asian. They have two little quote unquote fingers. Oh yeah, they do. On the end of the trunk at the top and on the bottom, there are what look like little lips that they can use to pinch things and grab yeah, stuff. Like a little index and finger and thumb. Exactly. It's like if you put your hand in a mitten and yep. we're grabbing things. Now, our Asian elephants, which are are in different areas throughout much of Asia. Yeah, what's what I assume the Jungle Book elephants would be. Absolutely, because this goes into India. And these are Elphus maximus, because it's only one species, but there are some subspecies. These are a little bit smaller, 8 to 10 feet tall, and they have some interesting differences. First off, females don't usually have tusks. Right. Or if they do, very small tusks. There are also tuskless males hmm. in the Asian elephants. So not as prominent tusks. They get about as long 
as the African when they have them, but usually not as hefty. And they only have one of those little fingers on the trunk. Yeah, yeah. And much smaller ears. We think the ears are partially because of the temperature where they live. African elephants deal with much higher temperatures, and those are good for cooling down. Yeah. They're full of blood vessels. And so, slightly different elephants, and remember that domed head, you see that in this. It looks like they've got kind of an extra forehead. This is notable in one of the fossil groups they were closely related to. We have three subspecies, the Indian, the Sumatran, and the Sri Lankan elephants. So, that's our elephants today. Which is interestingly still diverse there's still yes like obviously they're all elephants mm -hmm. but there is diversity of where they're living how they're living their body shape so not all elephants are you know there, there is a variety of elephants i mean it's still today the smallest species is almost half the size at max to the largest species so that is a, a decent amount of diversity and disparity but that's still not many species species no so how did elephants get their start i want to take a jump yes. in real quick because i want to address a, this is a thing i learned recently the word pachyderm yeah because you may have heard the word pachyderm used absolutely for elephants. yes 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 pachyderm means thick skin yes it does yep and apparently i read the grain of salt because i don't remember where i read this pachyderm used to be a term for elephants rhinos and hippos Oh, yes. That it was the big, gray, thick-skinned animals of yep. Africa, and then, for some reason, became associated with elephants. Interesting. That's what I read. But, regardless, pachyderm is not a taxonomic scientific no. term. It's a colloquial term that became sort of popular specifically with elephants. And it is accurate. They do have very thick skin, though sensitive. Very sensitive skin. Yeah. So do easily, hippos. Yes. Oddly. Easily sunburnt, easily bothered by insects. So that's why they take those mud baths. Yeah. So if you're wondering why you haven't heard the word pachyderm being used. Yeah. That's why. Because it was either what I just said or something similar. Go and Google that and confirm. That term came up when I was going through the physical features during my research. It did not come up anywhere else in the research because it's not I, scientific. I think at one point it was suggested to be a taxonomic term. Interesting. I think that might be how it got its start. That it was, oh big gray animals of africa we should use this yeah and everyone went no no so we're gonna go through the evolution of proboscideans very briefly uh because there's a lot that we could get into the different groups of elephant ancestors and relatives have been looked at in much 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 detail uh there are charismatic groups so they get a lot of attention when they're found so there are many who have been tracked down to exactly where they moved when and yep. who they interbred with and who they gave rise to we're not going to do all of that because we could do it for each group they're also easy to find yes so we know a lot about elephants for the same reason that we know a lot about the biggest dinosaurs as compared to like tiny bird-sized dinosaurs because elephants preserve better in the fossil record. And it's hard to confuse when you're looking at an elephant yeah, they're, yeah, it's very probably very rare that somebody goes, hey, wait a minute, this is an elephant. This is a big old taper. <laughs> uh, so generally speaking, it is often uh, cited that throughout proboscidean evolution, there are three major evolutionary radiations. So you th see three major moments of elephants and their ancestors going crazy. Right. Proboscidean explosions. Exactly. So early, early proboscidids. So these aren't even like, Real, some of these aren't really proboscideans yet, but they are close cousins to the ancestors of, or potentially ancestors of, later members. These are not elephant-like. This is the one group <laughs> we're going to talk about where if, you, if I showed you one of these, you probably wouldn't guess elephant. Or if you did, it would be a very close tie with tapers or hippos or something like that. Right. Well, you have to imagine that... like. Pretty quickly, elephants took on their familiar elephantine shape, but their common ancestors are shared with hyraxes and manatees. Yeah. Like, what does that ancestor look like? It's it's a tusked mouse mermaid. No. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. These actually have a very hippo-esque body design, and that's often what you'll see them compared to as hippos and tapirs, because okay. they have similar overall body designs we don't know that they were living similarly or that they had the same soft tissue right. squat round bodies squat round bodies and fairly small 
Uh, many of these were only you know a few feet tall at the shoulder, but tusked. Not, not all of them. Okay, but some of already had tusks. Some of them already had tusks, and some seem like they had the beginnings of trunks. So this is going back to the early Paleogene in Africa. Af elephants did get their start there, and so we see the earliest members close to 50, 60 million years ago. So okay. we're seeing definitely by 50 million years we have some early members. And for comparison, this is the same time period that we're seeing the very earliest developments of perissodactyls yes. or your paper rhino horse groups, your whale groups. Like this is when modern mammal groups were really coming into their own. Absolutely. And so as uh, these early proboscids, we'll talk about some of these early members in more detail later, but just to give you an idea. So in Africa, we start seeing these not quite elephant elephants showing up. In the Eocene and early Oligocene, we see some major diversification. So they start increasing in size, they start getting bigger, and they start taking on a much more elephant-like shape. Cool. So they start, they start getting longer legs, they start developing or seeming to develop true trunks. And then, and we're still mostly in Africa at this point, uh, so... I think there were some radiations out, but not quite yet. At the end of the Oligocene, or toward the end, there is a decline in diversity. Oh, oh no. So you see a, a bump and then a decline, and during the Miocene, we see the next diversification. Ah, it, it, elephants phase two. Yes. And here, Africa has now become connected to Europe and Asia, and... Uh, elephants unleashed. Oh, now they go crazy. <laughs> I like Proboscidean Evolution 2, <laughs> Elephants Unleashed. <laughs> I would watch it. I would watch it. Age of Elephants. Elephants should be in more scary monster movies. Yeah. Yeah, they elephants. really should. Whew. It's Or superhero movies. I'd watch a elephant-based heroic superhero? movie. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Larger than life. Yes. Yes. That's so good. I like it. <laughs> I like I like the hero. I'm put, I'm putting together a superhero in my head right now. Yeah, yeah. Larger it's, Than Life is a, a movie with Bill Murray and an elephant. Mastodon is already a bad guy, so we're not using him. That's true. <clears throat> so they start moving out. We see migrations into Eurasia, and some around this time even start to reach North America. So yeah. we're seeing true global expansion. They're not quite into South America. They're they're not everywhere. They never make it to Australia and Antarctica, so just forget about those. <laughs> we talked about those in previous episodes. They've had their time. Here's where we see some of the more famous fossil groups. The Dinotheres, the Macedon, the Mammoths, start to show up Gompotheres and their close cousins, which are the Shovel Tusked. Yeah. So we start seeing some really diverse forms as well, doing everything you can think of to do with the tusks. Many of these are from Africa through Eurasia and some even all the way around in North America, like single group across all those areas. So widely spread, diverse, all of which still, though, starting in Africa and radiating out. So, Which, which is cool because it's the same thing that humans did. Yes, absolutely. Started in Africa and then moved around the world. On the backs of these elephants, I assume. Now, yeah, we rode the, with yes. cowboy hats. <laughs> And then the third. No, no, now we should specify because that's a funny joke. But this is all happening before oh, human yeah. humans did not radiate out until way later. No, no, proboscideans were the trendsetters. Yeah, we make that clear they at the outset. Blazed the trail, probably mm -hmm. literally. Yes, yes. <laughs> they stomped Beringia flat, and then we could walk over it. Just reshaping the <laughs> ecosystem all along the way, as keystone species do. We hopped from Asia to North America on the backs of sunken elephants. <laughs> With all their little trunks. <laughs> the third radiation actually is still in the Miocene, just in the late Miocene. So, the right. busy, busy time. We see our shovel tusked proboscideans start to give way to newer groups so this is the decline of the shovels and we start seeing some more recognizable groups stegodontids which we'll talk about these are some interesting groups and then the elephantids Ooh. which eventually leads to our modern elephants yes now in many of these groups there's a huge diversity even if there are famous individual genuses and species but we can't go through all of those within the elephantids we get a, just a little more detail quickly, because this includes our modern 
African and Asian elephants, but also the mammoths. Mammoths. So that's a fun fact that I don't think gets talked about often enough. Because most fossil proboscideans are treated as all these weirdos or all elephants. Right. And the truth is, only one of the famous fossil ones is what you could call an elephant. And that, it, it, it's, it's fascinating because it's very much mammoths are among the same close-knit family as modern elephants. Mm-hmm. Mastodons are super weird. Yeah, they're they're way over there, but they always whole get other branch next to each other. Yep, and they coexisted. Yes, they did. They lived. Yeah, they they're both famous ice age animals, even though the groups have very different histories, very different body shapes, very different ecologies. Yes. Yeah. And so, to give you a brief idea with our our elephants and what they did, the mo- the ancestors for. African, Asian, and mammoths spread from Africa. They started in Africa. The Africans, for the most part, stayed in Africa. Hmm. There are some radiations we see, some evidence that there was uh, a walking abroad, but the mainly it stayed in Africa whilst Asian elephants moved throughout Europe and Asia, and mammoths moved through there all the way to North America. Yes. And an interesting fact here, to really emphasize what we mean when I say these are closely related, the Asian and mammoth, from what we can tell of all the evidence, are more closely related than either is to the African. Yes. So mammoths actually stand between the Asian and the African elephants. So yeah. it, they, they were northern-dwelling, fuzzy Asian elephants. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they have the same hump. That's why when you see Manny in Ice Age, it looks like he's got this big tall hairdo yeah his skull has a bump on it like asian elephants do <laughs> we should also mention that uh because you mentioned them getting into north america and toward the mo- most recent times they did eventually go to south america exactly during the pleistocene the beginning of the pleistocene we see huge radiations with the elephants we see diversification and then late pleistocene as many big mammals did we lose most of them all but three. All but three, eventually. Some eked out for a little while and then still died. But they did really, really well, and then we lost almost all of them. Specifically, now, I'm, I'll make a couple of references here. In episode 43, we talked about the Great American Biotic Interchange, yes. which is the event that brought elephants to their final dominion, yes. the, the last continent that they conquered with South America, and then, as we discussed in episode 25, the Pleistocene extinction, at the end of the Pleistocene, we lose all elephants in South America, North America, Europe, and most of Asia. Yes. And all that, and we lost a bunch of things in Africa as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. All that's left is Africa, and it is this incredibly diminished diversity of elephants. We missed out on global elephants. Yes. Like us modern people by... A hundred thousand years? Yeah. Maybe? of And of every shape and size you could think of. Yeah, mammoths, mastodons, gompathiers. It was a heyday, which really, once again, emphasizes, as we've we've mentioned before, that we are living in a diminished world. A post-extinction world. Yes. And, and, a, and a present extinction world. <laughs> Episode 55. Yeah, I mean, we, hey, <laughs> we don't have much uh, uh, challenge left on the elephant <laughs> side so we can we can do oh, it just finish them right off oh yeah one two three bam uh, world elephant day is <sighs> august 12th happy world <laughs> elephant day everybody so that <laughs> is a brief overview of what are elephants and what have they done over history of their really weird group so now let's look at how really weird they were we're gonna take a glimpse at some of these groups some of these individuals that we mentioned and just briefly what were some of their features what are some of the different weird experiments that proboscideans attempted throughout their history let's meet the proboscideans So proboscideans, as we mentioned, were an incredibly successful group 
especially when you take their entire history into account. Uh, I found multiple suggestions for numbers. So I'm not going to quote a specific one for how many species have been identified. Yeah. But it's near or a, just above 200 or so. So there were a lot of varieties that we've known of compared to the small number we have now. And they took just about every shape you could imagine an elephant taking. The early ones, so our early probos, were those not quite elephant, more hippotapir individuals. Some of these, some of the earliest recognized members of the proboscidean group, would be things like phosphotherium. This is often, you'll see, called the earliest recognized proboscidean. Cool. From Morocco, almost 60 million years ago, about 58 or so. And this was very odd looking. Uh, the one thing I read described its skull as very disproportionate. So it had that squat body. We're not expecting anything big here. It was fairly short. And its skull had was very long, but with a very short snout. So the face is kind of all down at the front of the skull. Weird. No long nose. No tusks. Particularly, uh. it kind of it kind of looked like a tapir, but with no schnoz. Yeah, yeah. So, is there no like muscle attachment area for the trunk? No evidence of it. Interesting. Uh, I don't know how complete the most complete skull is, but right, right. I saw no mention of it potentially having any trunk. So we should specify that in an elephant skull. It is very clear. Yes. You've got your nasal opening. You've got all this muscle attachment. Like, that big trunk leaves... It takes a up a lot of real yeah. estate on the face. <laughs> there's, a, there's a space for it. Yes. It has a reserved parking yes. space. Yes, it does. Right up there. So it's it's very clear when where that trunk is when you see a an, an, an modern elephant-like proboscidean. And even if you, like, if you look up a picture of a tapir skull, they also have this very weird front of the face for all of their muscles for that lip nose that they have. Yep. So these don't seem to really have it. Now, we do start to see a little bit more in something like Erytherium, which is also Morocco uh, a little bit later. But neither of these for sure had anything uh, a trunk or tusk-like. Both, though, are interesting because they had fairly normal mammal teeth. So Weird. So we, we had not specialized <laughs> down to just molars that march forward. That's what they call them, marching molars. I forgot that yep, term marching earlier. Molars. It's my favorite. It's one of my favorite <laughs> biological terms. They don't have that. They just had teeth. And they were fairly mundane teeth they looked kind of piggish like I, ours i picture now it's weird to me because it's like when you have those pictures online where someone will put human teeth yeah. inside an animal's another animal's mouth well it's like when you if they, everyone go look up a sheep head fish they look like they are wearing dentures it's like that <laughs> yep <laughs> so these don't look very elephanty you'll see them drawn sometimes more taper-esque but sometimes that's more hypothetical than direct evidence and about a meter tall, so three feet ish, small little early cousins of the elephants. Weird. I, I, I keep picturing them like tapers. Yes. They sound a lot like tapers. Now, it's not sure, and it's not, uh, I don't think it's even highly suggested that these are the direct ancestors to any particular, but these are some of the earliest members of this group. Right. I like the phrase ancestral cousins. Yes. Ancestral cousins is a really good encapsule. Now, more Ethereum is a slightly later we're getting into eocene to early oligocene now remember that was one of our one of our pulses yeah so we're just under 40 million years ago absolutely and this is north africa these still small we're looking at just over two feet so i saw one thing that compared it to like fox sized you know weird it is but now there are some recognizable features Shape of the teeth still is fairly simple, suggests soft water plants, maybe. So it may have been living like a tapir, but it does have some small tusk-like teeth. They compare it more to a hippo than to elephant for sure. So it may have not been visible outside of the mouth, or they may have been very, very tiny. 
Interesting. But they do have some tusk-like incisors, and it seems like it might have had the beginnings of a trunk. And so, if not a trunk, maybe that flexible lip, very maneuverable, like a tapir again. Or a rhino, if you... If yes. You, like, even rhinos have very flexible lips. Absolutely, where they, they reach out. Yeah, and you can picture, you can see that mark that transition from the rhino lip to the taper yes. sort of long schnoz and then when evolution gets to it loses supervision yeah absolutely and just goes crazy with it then you get i elements. feel like once you get <laughs> once you get a certain distance away from the front teeth then it's just and you just yep. stretch it out and, just, and then you find the optimal length yes <laughs> yep <laughs> once you get one little like one little ringlet away you can just stretch yep. that you are all trying six inch long trunks turns out six feet perfect yeah it's <laughs> you move a decimal point guys <laughs> you move a decimal point. um now this is one of the last small members so once we get past this point things start getting big yeah well this is our radiation time absolutely elephant uh, uh what did i say before probosidians phase one Yes, yes. Dawn of the Elephants. Uh, the, the unassuming Probosidians. Yeah, Probosidian 1, an unexpected journey. <laughs> and some of the earliest members of our big Probosidians are the Dinotheres. Yeah, the Thunder Bee, or Terrible Beasts, I'm sorry. The Terrible Beasts. Terrible Dino Beasts. Fear. Terrible Beasts. Terrible Beasts. And they weren't terrible at all. <laughs> they were cool and weird. Yeah, they had sweet goatees. They had awesome goatees. <laughs> so we are in the Oligocene to Pleistocene here. And during this time, they very likely were some of the largest land animals. So this is, right, starting in the late Oligocene. Mm -hmm. This means that these are some of the first mammals to hit dinosaur proportions. Absolutely. Because now you're, I mean, elephants today, like a five-ton elephant is a, like a reasonably sized elephant yes they get real big they are massive and for most of the cenozoic very little else on land ever competes with elephants for size which is very it's a neat idea that this is now the first time where mammals produce something that could have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with dinosaurs at oh, their height yeah. absolutely and so dinotheres we see them start in Africa, but they spread throughout Europe and Asia, so fairly wide distribution. And their most distinctive feature on many of their members is two tusks on the lower jaw. The front of the jaw has turned downward, and the tusks are paired and curved back toward the neck like a hooked dual goatee. Yeah! It's so weird. Pictures in the blog post. Oh, all the pictures of all these weirdos. This cool... Now, we should point out, actually, that... Because some people might be stuck on the lower tusk thing. Yeah. Lots of probosidians had lower tusks. This will not be the the first... The last or only set of lower tusks we mentioned in this episode. They were common across mastodons, mm -hmm. dinotheres. Dinotheres had them. Modern elephants do not have them. It's actually kind of weird that they don't. They are... it. They were not uncommon. Yes. Dinotheres took it and went nuts with it and are notable because they they only many of them have those lower tusks yeah there's not an upper like uh, uh the shovel tusks which we'll talk about mm -hmm. have their lower tusks are shovely shaped and they'll have short upper tusks yeah they have quote-unquote normal tusks and then weird bottom tusks and lots of mastodons will have big upper tusks mm -hmm. and then little lower just tusks little, boop, little. just sticking straight out mm-hmm Whereas modern elephants and mammoths have the upper tusks, but no lower tusks. Yes. Dinotheres only had the lower tusks. And so they, they you know, you might as well yes. make the most of them. Lean into it. They, they, they <laughs> went the other way with the coin flip for st starting on top or bottom with the tusks. <laughs> and there's been lots of conjecture as to what they were using these tusks for. Of course, some of the earliest suggestions where they were digging with them because it's pointing toward the ground by digging on hills <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> it's great 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 and and just go talk to someone who studies elephants and bring that up and they will tell you very quickly no, no were, stop it they were not digging <laughs> with their chin where they can't even see what they're doing 
Like, yeah. But what we think they were doing was scraping vegetation, scraping bark or shearing branches down, using mm-hmm. it to hook vegetation and bring it in. The wear pattern suggests that it was being used to gather plant material. How exactly? It's hard to say. Another thing that I'm going to mention now, and you can just kind of assume it is true throughout the rest, we can't give a definite picture of the trunk because it's all soft tissue. Yeah. So exact length, exact shape. Did it have two little... Exactly what an elephant's uh, uh, ancient proboscidean's trunk might have looked like is hard to definitely say. We can tell pretty clearly, as you were saying, when they do and don't have one because of the face, what it looked like at the end and how long it... That's, that's something we can't give you. Which is a real shame. Oh my goodness, is it a shame. Because given the diversity of where they lived and how they lived and ecology and diet and stuff in elephants, I can only imagine the diversity of trunks. It's got to be super weird. Like, because the modern ones have those little fingery things, the African elephants. Like, who knows what they came up with? Like, what, anything you can imagine could have been at the end of this. What if you had an elephant? Because the trunk is still the two nostrils. Yeah. So if you look at the end of the trunk, it's still two little holes. What What if uh, they like split them at the end? Yeah. Or what if and the it's like a snake tongue nostril stopped not at the end? What if they only had a manipulate? Like, we don't know. Who knows what they could have done? It could have been more lip than nose. They could on have some had a them. hand. Yes. At the end of the, <laughs> it's a real well. But and like you were, saying, it's like trying to interpret a tree from its roots. Yes. All you have is that attachment point, and it. Uh, what we need are elephants that laid down in very soft mud. Yes, and we can see the trunk preserved <laughs> in the. What we sediment. need is an elephant walk of fame, where they did trunk impressions <laughs> instead of hands <laughs> next to their stars, and then we could go through. What part of the reason I bring this up is because there's awesome paleo art for all of these, but as we talked about in our paleo art episode sixty four. Paleo art, by definition, is wrong. Some, at, at least a little. At least a little. <laughs> often a lot. So when you see drawings of these ancient proboscideans, they just have elephant trunks. Yeah. We don't know that that's what they had. We know they had a trunk, but we don't know that it looked like our picture of a trunk. Because yep. once again, what we have today is a very small sample. Someday, maybe. Another big famous group that came along not too far off after uh, around and after our dino theers were the mammutidae the mastodon mastodons here's a quick note about the word mastodon that i learned this recently yes so the reason so there is no like mastodon is not again not a taxonomic no name it's mammut mammut like the famous mastodons are mammut yep is the genus which makes one wonder why are they called mastodons do tell us if yeah. mastodon was originally proposed as a genus name but later discovered to be the same animal as one already called mammut mm-hmm. so the word mastodon was meant to be a genus name then scientists went oh but that it's an extra name we don't need it yep. but the name had already become popular same thing as brontosaurus exactly said brontosaurus became popular then the scientists went oh but actually it's the same we don't need that name anymore so mastodon cuvier was one of the ones at least i don't know if it was originally who proposed mastodon and was overturned and it's named it means breast tooth because a mastodon's tooth is very distinctive among other proboscidean teeth whilst most of these teeth are like flat files Big, tall, thick files, but still the surface is flat and ridged. Yep. It looks like a nail file in many ways. Yep. For grinding up tough food. Mastodons have these bumped. They have all these little cusps. It looks like an upside down egg carton. Yes. And it's really distinctive. So it looked like nipples. And Cuvier, after spending... Hours shut away alone in yep. his lab, doubtless. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and was shot down, rightfully so, for Mammut. Fun fact, another genus name that was suggested and later 
uh, discarded for ma- uh, mammoth, uh, Macedons? Leviathan. That's a little bit of a shame. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Mm. <laughs> so the mammoths. <laughs> um, these are very cool. This is a very cool group. Extremely diverse. So we, I, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about two of the most famous and most well-known uh, and, and, and most studied mm-hmm. is the American Mastodon and the Pacific Mastodon. Which is new. Which is very new. We, so, in fact, we talked about it in an, I don't remember which episode, but earlier this year. Yes, <laughs> this year. So, Amer- Mammut Americanum is the American Mastodon and was thought to be America's Mastodon. North America, it thought it was thought to cover our continent, north, south, east, west, and that it was the dominant, you know, Mastodon here. Recently, they found that Mastodons west of the Sierra Nevada mountains actually are a different species, the Pacific Mastodon, Mammut Pacificus. Yeah, this was a study by Alton Dooley, yes, who we got was. to meet recently. Yes, it was very it... cool. Uh, which identified all those western mastodons as a separate species which is cool starting with max the famous mastodon we got to meet max yes we did last month and so max is a a famous mastodon that is currently housed in hemet at the california western science center yeah and is a large mastodon big upturned tusks and was denoted separate from the uh american mastodon because like david was mentioning Many of the American Mastodons had those little chin tusks, and Pacific Mastodons lack those. They also have six vertebrae in their sacral section, and the hips, mm-hmm. which is unusual. So we have those two really well-known Mastodons here right. in North America. Proper mammut, yes. that is. And they're later, too. So these are, throughout the Pleistocene, Ice Age, more recent. Mm-hmm. Now, mammut goes back to the late Miocene. So there was a good run-up of time where they were much more diverse. You see them. They're very well known through North and Central America, but there are members from Africa, Eurasia, and North America. So they were widely distributed. And this is a good time to mention that a lot of the, and we won't get into this a lot, but a lot of the origins and interrelationships of these different groups are very mysterious and difficult to determine. Case in point, over at the Gray Fossil Site, <laughs> we have recently excavated a skeleton and then a bunch of partials of a mastodon. Yes. And it's weird. Very weird. Very weird mastodon. Can't say much about it because it's not officially studied yet. It's a very strange earlier mastodon. And every time I talk with Chris, Dr. Widga, our Probo expert, about it, he comments on how unusual it is and where does this fit and i've heard him com- uh, 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 comment that in order to properly study this thing someone <laughs> is gonna have to restudy the elephant the mastodon yeah. family tree and that's when i was going through during research for this episode i found a number of other north american mastodon listed and at the end of almost each of the sections it was but many feel that it is indistinguishable from the American Mastodon. Right. And many disagree <laughs> that it is actually just American Mastodon. And so, yeah, it's it's not... It can be very murky distinguishing all the individuals and why some are the way they are and where they came from and how they got here. In fact, the uh, what was really weird about the gray fossil site Mastodon is when they found the skull, the teeth are what you just described. Very classic yes. mastodon teeth. But the rest of it is weird. <laughs> it's very unique. Its face is shaped somewhat different. So it's mastodons have all this weirdness. Here's a fun fact about mastodons that I also learned while talking to Chris not too long ago that I hadn't realized. People come to the Gray Fossil site mm-hmm. and they'll ask about elephants. Because yes. we say mastodon. And people will say mammoth because... That's a little bit more famous. They're the two people know, and so people get them confused. The gray fossil site is too old for mammoths. Yeah. Mastodons made it to North America way before mammoths did. Yeah, so take that, mammoths. So they weren't even there yet. Yeah, pick up the pace. (laughs) 
just to give you a brief idea, because we talked about Mastodons looking different, uh, they did look very elephant-like, but they had shorter legs, a longer body. So they they kind of look like a, a dropped-down elephant, they are like a dachshund elephant, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and were more, like, heavily built. Yeah. Uh, so they were stocky. They it, It's something where when you see it drawn and compare it to an elephant, it just looks a little weird. It looks like someone got the proportions off. Right, right. But otherwise, they had those long, upcurved tusks, sometimes on the chin. Uh, yep, sometimes lower tusks than upper tusks. Of note, of course, you say they have the long, curved tusks. They have that short elephant-like face. Mm -hmm. They have, but they're shorter. None of that is true about the gray fossils at Mastodon. No, no. So there's diversity. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. So the mammoths are actually a, a very diverse group. Yeah. I focused on the two most famous ones. I'm sure there's someone out there right now that goes, no, you talked about them again. Yeah, <laughs> my favorites didn't get mentioned. Yeah, like it. We, we talked about the, the, it's like when you watch documentaries and they always use the same animals for the same examples of things. Yeah. So, and some use chemicals. The Bombardier. Be well, I can guarantee we're among the first people to do an overview of Mastodons to talk about the Pacific Mastodon. Yes, absolutely. So we're tra pla blazing a trail. We're on the cutting edge. And as for our typical seamless segue, speaking of cutting edges. Hey now. Shovel tusked elephants. So I, we got to be real clear. Yes. When we say shovel tusk, like picture little tusks coming out of the chin, mm -hmm. like straight out of the chin but broadened into the shape of a spoon. They look like it has two two tusks on the bottom. So tusks are, based, are as far as I'm aware, always paired. Yeah. I, I can't think Unless of Unless you're a narwhal. Yes. And you're just the worst. Why would you do that? But yeah, <laughs> two paired tusks on the bottom. But they look like Phillips head screwdrivers. Just yeah. Just sticking out of the chin. Just it's a scoop. It's a scoop. And there, there was a variety. Some of them had long, narrow flat teeth some had wide short flat teeth and there are actually multiple groups of these shovel tusks so the famous one is the gompatheres mm -hmm. that's usually what you'll hear about is gompatheres and then there's also the the amibelodontids which have been grouped with gompatheres but also are grouped on their own sometimes so okay. i'm going to talk about them both separately because i am not a Proboscidean taxonomist. <laughs> <laughs> so these are fairly recent. We're in the in getting down to the just over ten million years or so that we start seeing many of these these members. Uh, widespread uh, across North America, well known. Many of them made it down into South America, and this group has insane diversity. Yeah, it is super weird. So. If we zoom in on a couple, you know, just just a few to get an idea. So we have Gompatherium, which is the, the notable Gompather. Welded Beast is what that name means, which is oh, fun. awesome. <laughs> this is known throughout uh, Eurasia, Africa, and North America. And it has those two upper tusks and then flat and lower tusks with an expanded mouth, like a scoop, like a shovel. And then we have Emibelodon. This one's just North American, and we're looking at... This one is known from the Miocene. They also had those lower tusks, but it was actually a much longer, thinner jaw with elongated, still scoop-like incisors, but not the flattened, wide jaw. Huh, so a, a spoon instead of a shovel. So think of, if, if anyone ever did much yard work, the Gompatherium has that square shovel. That you use to like scrape stuff off the sidewalk and yeah, yeah. all that stuff. And then I mean, Belladon had that narrow shovel you use for digging trenches. <laughs> that that just is almost just a little bit wider than the handle. One of those. Interesting. So it's starting to sound like like a ceratopsian Yeah. Horns and frills, like the horn dinosaurs. Which you just did all sorts of stuff with it. Super weird stuff. You also have uh Plady Belladon, which is another famous one. This is the flat spear tusk. <laughs> they have such good names. Also, Miocene, but this one's Africa, Asia, and so a bit, bit more widespread. Very similar to Emibelodon, but shorter and slightly broader jaw 
with those square incisors again. So even across groups, you have w convergence potentially. Right, mixing and matching. Lots of weird stuff. This is another one of those examples where everyone argued for a very long time about what they were doing with that weird mouth. Yep. And the shovel tusk part of the name was a very heavy part of many of those suggestions, is that they were scooping stuff. Yeah. They were scooping up tubers. They were digging up roots and potatoes, or they were scooping up marsh plants. And, yep. it, and you'll see that in art, them pulling up like aquatic plants or pulling out or, or scraping through things. Mm -hmm. And that's been a very strong image for them for a long time that I still see cited. Oh, yeah. In many, 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 you know, bits of, you know, fun fact information about these shovel tusked. Uh, you'll see them called shovel tusked elephants, even though they're not elephants. But not, yeah, not, not elephants in the yeah. modern sense. Tuskers. <laughs> but research on the wear of the tusks suggests they were not digging with them mm -hmm. and that they were actually using it to one one study even compared it to a scythe to cut into foliage or scrape off bark right right there was one really cool suggestion based partially on the wear because many of those flat teeth actually have a a scooped wear that they are they are wearing out by scraping it against something so that's why scraping bark has been suggested. But one suggested is that they were grabbing a foliage like a like a branch or something like that, and then using the teeth to cut it, to saw it off. <laughs> like grab it with their trunk. Grab it with their trunk, and then saw it off <laughs> at the base, so that they could just perfectly snatch it off. You know, I wouldn't put it past I elephants. I would not. No. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, we have a lot of different shapes, and so something like Amibelodon, which has a more narrow jaw. Much of the wear showed that it was a, a opportunistic feeder, so it was feeding in many different ways. So they may not have been a specialized tool. It actually may have been a general tool. Interesting. Which is not what you might expect for such a weird face. Right. Yeah, well, it, it is the generalized version of having a shovel yes. on your face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the <laughs> standard shovel face. Yeah, all-terrain all, all -terrain shovel face. <laughs> We do see some cool things. There are some studies that have been able to look at growth series, so we get an idea of how it develops, Ooh. which is very cool. Young uh, platybelodons had itty-bitty little scoops on their lower jaw that, as they got older, lengthened and widened. And so, as a fetus, it was just a pinch. Just a pinched-in area of the chin. As a juvenile, it was more spread out they call it y-shaped and a little bit scooped as an adult it actually is wide at the end narrows and then widens back again for the jaw and yep. has a deep scoop so that extreme shape did not come in and they don't note much evidence of sexual dimorphism because if this is being used to get food it's not something that would become sexually dimorphic right. everybody needs it everyone needs that dramatic shape change makes me wonder if they were using it differently at different yeah. life stages like are, when you're young niche partitioning are you using it for something different yep so very weird group the final weird thing i want to note is remember when we were talking about we don't know what trunks look like yeah well man are there some weird images of what their trunks might look like yep one of the famous ones you'll see <laughs> is what the article I read, the what called the flap, the lip flap, Ooh. which is, if you look up a picture of a gompathere, often you will find it scooping up marsh plants, and then the trunk has turned into this flattened upper duckbill thing that just flops on top of the lower jaw to make like a big, long, floppy upper jaw. Yeah. And research says, no, we don't think they had that. There's no evidence that they had that. That was a speculative uh, reconstruction. That took off. That became very popular. All the evidence from the, the skull seems to suggest they had a, a fairly normal trunk. Andrew. Well, this also, because when I pick your shovel tusks, I always, you, you, you it, it's weird to think, how does the trunk drape over those tusks? Yes. But I don't know if there has been research into how they would have held their skull. Yeah. 
because this is something that comes up a lot in discussions about mammoths, mastodons, and other proboscideans, is what is the orientation of your skull yes. to determine usually how your tusks stuck out. Mm -hmm. But if the shovel tusks were holding their heads in a way that the tusks were angled down, then your trunk just sits normally. Mm -hmm. And I, it doesn't have to be something weird. I also love the picture of the trunk curled up in the scoop like soft serve ice cream just just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> just right there on your, on your bottom jaw it's just it's curled in like helicoprion's jaw <laughs> yes yes it's a little spiral and you just sn yeah. snug it right in your upper lip you extend it for birthday surprises <laughs> <laughs> we'll actually talk about some weird trunk behavior with this next group so now we're getting closer to some of our, our, our modern groups, many of these look very elephant-like, just a little different. The stegodontids are one of those. Uh, these are a, a group that, for all intents and purposes, look like an elephant, just with a few different features. They, they tend to have very long, very straight tusks, not, not so much the extremely curved ones that we tend to know and these are african asian some did make it to north america so same sort of distribution that we've talked about up till now once again a cool name they are roof tooth hmm. a roofed tooth these are really notable for those tusks because when i said they are long and straight i mean very long there are some that could grow up to 10 feet long which wow. is not unheard of among proboscideans right right there are others who have tusked long but also so close together that it makes for some interesting uh hypotheses about how they might have been living with those tusks so there are some that when fully grown in older individuals the tusks have grown so large and are so close together that it doesn't seem like there's any space between them for a trunk Huh. Which has suggested that they may have had to carry their trunk off to one side of the tusks at older ages. Which is weird. There, there was one article that called them the sideways trunked elephants. Weird. See, I would just rest it in the groove. Yeah, that that was my immediate response to that <laughs> suggestion. Is like, what? But the what the part of what they're bringing up is if you're going to reach down to do stuff with your trunk, you can't reach in between. You, you have to go over the side. You have to go over the side to do stuff. Weird. Yeah. Elephants are weird. It's so strange. <laughs> it's just a, a, a weird thing to do with your face. So we're down to our last few groups, and we're going to talk about one of the, the most popular, the mammoths. Yeah, we made it. Mammothus. Mammothus. The genus Mammothus. The genus Mammothus. These are famous for having spiraled tusks. So... These are the ones that you see with those crazy curly Q tusks that curve around and in. So while many elephants, they just slope down and then up. They curve in one way. These actually corkscrew a little bit. Yeah. And, which is very interesting uh, feature and could have lots of uses. I haven't heard direct reasonings for, yes, this is what it was for. Yeah. But there's lots of stuff I've seen. Shoving away snow is one of the ones I've seen before. And otherwise, mammoth, like you said before, close relatives yes. of modern elephants, especially Asian elephants, their teeth are very similar, their body shape are very similar. Uh, in a lot of cases, these would have looked very much like modern elephants. It's very likely that if we still had mammoths, we'd call them elephants. Oh, absolutely. Like they Absolutely. They are That's just an elephant. Yeah. I don't the word mammoth would not exist. <laughs> no, I don't think That's so. That's just an elephant. It would just be the corkscrew tusk elephant or the the, the, woolly the elephant. hairy elephant. Yeah, the hairy from elephant up in Siberia. Exactly. And that is one of the things that they are notable for. Now not all mammoths were woolly. Nope. I want to make that clear. There is a species known as the woolly mammoth. The woolly mammoth. <laughs> so that is one of the most well-known fossil animals out there. It's it's right up there with T-Rex and Triceratops. Yes, but there were... Triceratops, woolly mammoth. But there were several species of mammoth. Absolutely. And they ranged uh, uh, across all the ranges we've been talking about, so they were not isolated 
in any way. They had a, a huge diversity, lots of mammoths all over the place. But two of the most well-known are the Colombian and woolly mammoth. These were both known here in North America, but also have ranges. The uh, famous mammoth steppe, which was the habitat of the woolly mammoth, Mammothus primogenius, is an area that stretches that stretches across northern Asia and through many parts of Europe, as well as northern parts of North America during the last ice age. So a, a large stretch. And we've mentioned this before. This is a biome. Yes. That doesn't exist anymore that was defined in part by its keystone species, mammoths. Yes. And one of them known as the steppe mammoth. Yep. So you you had a number of mammoths spread out. And that is specifically during the Pleistocene, yes. the Ice Age. Yes. So mammoths, most of these, so mammoths go back to millions of years ago, mm -hmm. before the Ice Age. All these groups showed up well before the Ice Age, yes. some back to the Oligocene. All of them survived into the Pleistocene, yeah. the most recent major geologic epoch. So they were very successful during this time. The... Columbia mammoth is notable because it was one of the largest of the mammoths. This was getting up to the size of African elephants. Mm -hmm. the, the largest African elephants, 13 feet tall again. And was actually a more warmer southern distributed mammoth. So very likely was not or would have been much less woolly than the woolly mammoth. Right. So once again, not all mammoths are woolly. <laughs> they probably, for many of them, would have just looked like elephants, except for having curly Q tusks. Which, of course, raises the question of how we know they were woolly in the first place. Yes, woolly mammoths are super cool, because not only are they uh, one of the last of the mammoths, last surviving members. In fact, according to one fossil group, which we'll talk about in a second, the last. Yeah. But they lived in Siberia. Sure did. And in Siberia, you have something wonderful called permafrost. Yes. Ice Age Siberia. Yes. Permafrost. And so this is stuff that stays frozen. Permanently frozen. Permafrost. And it froze some mammoths. We have <laughs> frozen, young mostly, yeah. proboscideans. Yes, we do. And we've talked about them in the news about We've talked about Luba and there was another one whose name I don't remember that are frozen baby mammoths. Which means we have a really detailed look at the anatomy of the woolly mammoth. Yep. They are also one of the only animals in general, specifically proboscideans, to have been depicted in ancient art. Yes. By humans. Absolutely. We definitely, our ancestors interacted with these fuzzy elephants. Yeah. And these were not your average elephant in the fact that one of the articles I read described some of the most specialized proboscideans that we've ever seen because they are super adapted to the cold. Everything. They have thick fur, which is obvious. Their fur was ridiculously thick, up to 12 inches long in certain areas of the upper body and up to 35 inches long along their sides and underside. Wow, that's three feet. These are three feet foot of hair just hanging down it's a meter of hair it's very woolly yes it's a good name it's a good name <laughs> but they also had a whole bunch of other features for surviving the cold very small ears mm -hmm. reduce that heat loss they had fat storage around the neck and withers which is that space between the the shoulder blades for surviving harsh times they had three mutations adapted for cold weather that it's best better oxygen uh usage which we know because we get their dna we have their dna out of that permafrost <laughs> yes we well, do. and other play and just they're young enough to get dna from mm -hmm. their fossils and this is also going to help them in higher altitudes but you mentioned earlier about just think how diverse trunks must have been the woolly mammoth seems to have a feature on its trunk called a fur mitten yeah which was a spot where they could tuck the, their, their trunk in and per, hypothetically, per, potentially, protect it from the cold. And they think it may have been to be able to grab snow, tuck it in, and melt it before drinking it or melting it in the body. As well as protecting the Just trunk. Protecting the trunk. 
I, it makes me think of when I, when it's cold out and I pull my hand into the sleeve yes, of yes, my jacket. Exactly. Yeah. They they wore extra large winter clothes just yeah. like many of us do. Long sleeves to be cozy. Long sleeves, draping, fur coat. And so these are really cool proboscideans. These were Arctic specialists. And they are the ancient pro- the extinct proboscidean we know the most about because of all these incredible fossil finds. And one of the fossil animals yes that we are best acquainted with yes we know a lot about mammoths and they were also fairly diverse in their morphology because our next category deals with dwarf proboscideans of which there were a lot of mammoths we would be remiss yes to not so most of what we've been talking about yes right so so a, a picture of the pleistocene all of the groups we mentioned, except for the early hippo-like mm-hmm. ones, made it into the Pleistocene, the Ice Age, the last couple million years. So you had members of all these groups around the world. That If you go back to the Pleistocene, <laughs> there are several major different groups of proboscideans in the Absolutely. world at the same time, which is crazy. And many of those made it to islands and got... S- Itty bitty. <laughs> they did. So where they're famous for being huge, and a lot of them were, right? We're talking yes. five, eight, ten ton, some of them even bigger than that, animals, the biggest on the planet. But if you go all the way back to episode four, yep, we talked about what happens when animals make it to islands. Insular dwarfism. On islands, you tend to get small animals getting big and big animals getting small. As they adjust to this restricted space and restricted materials, restricted resources. And there were indeed dwarf proboscideans. A lot of them. I can't, we literally, to to emphasize, I can't go through and name all the dwarf proboscideans that are known because we don't have enough time. (laughs) Like, (laughs) it happened a lot. It happened very often because elephants are actually very good swimmers and they swim to islands all the time. Like, they, they hop to near you know, within view islands all the time. They've actually been used by loggers to log on islands. Oh, cool. Log on the island, tie the logs to the elephant, they float, and the elephant tows them back to land. (laughs) So they're really good swimmers. Like I said, they use that trunk as a snorkel. And you also have to imagine that being that large, like, it's super impressive that elephants manage to be that large. Mm -hmm. They've adapted to being that large. But given half an evolutionary chance to scrap that oh yeah and be more like efficient and resource minded yeah i imagine that dwarfism comes very easily oh yeah to the largest land animals and since uh we were mentioning the pleistocene being that that heyday much of this happened during the pleistocene where populations were isolated by the fluctuating sea levels during that time so while some of it may have been I came to this island, some of it may be I came to this hill and now I'm yes. on an island. <laughs> I came, my grandparents moved over to this hill <laughs> and now I can't leave. Yep. <laughs> and so we see a lot of dwarfism. I'm not going to go through every example. I'll mention a couple of really, really interesting ones. But when we talk dwarf, we mean like four, five, six feet tall. Yeah, we're talking now they're like rhino size. Yeah. And so some of these were really, really unique in the size. And some of them had other interesting features. One dwarf straight-tusked elephant uh, on the island of Sicily was the smallest identified, I, or at least one of the smallest. I'm always hesitant to be smallest, largest. <laughs> but this was a proboscidean that weighed around 600 pounds. So wow. itty bitty. Uh, oh, sorry, no, I was, I was one up. Weighed around 500 pounds. Wow. And also had a very large brain, comparable proportionally to us. Interesting. So you get some interesting things here. This was a three-foot-tall elephant. It was itty-bitty, itty-bitty. Uh, <laughs> we also get a number of others. There's the ones that were on uh, some of the stegodons were known in Indonesia and have been hypothesized to be one of the main food sources for the Komodo dragon. Interesting. <laughs> that they think that might have been why Komodo dragons got so big was to hunt tiny elephants. They also, those stegodons are found 
at least some of them on the island of Floris, which yes, is where Homo floresiensis, mm-hmm. the potentially dwarf human species or human relative, yeah, has been found. Tiny elephants for tiny people to ride around. Yes. <laughs> and then the one I had to mention is the Wrangell Island dwarf woolly mammoth. Yes. This is the one we have to have to mention. So Wrangell Island in Siberia, a tooth was found that when analyzed dated back to about 4,300 years old. This is a population of woolly mammoths on an island off of Siberia that became dwarfed and survived to just over at at best 4,000 years years ago which means they were around six thousand years after the mainland woolly mammoths disappeared so for six thousand years we still had woolly mammoths hanging around in one small population at least up until some of early human civilization was getting kicked off oh yeah well you know we're talking about mammoths that were around when the pyramids were when the pyramids were being made not in the same place ten thousand bc no but also, they wouldn't help you build a pyramid. They're dwarfs. And they're dwarfs. And they're woolly. They live up in the north. So these were up in Siberia. Like, you could feasibly have visited the pyramids of Giza and then taken a long trip to Siberia and gone and seen tiny mammoths. <laughs> to the woolly mammoth petting zoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this dwarfism not only made some interesting individuals, it also seemed to be a, a little haven for woolly mammoths for a while. A little refugium. A refugium. Which is awesome. So, some cool dwarfs. And to end things off, I want to talk about the biggest proboscidean on the record. And that's now, what that's significant because proboscidean, no other group of animals <laughs> has mastered that size. There have been some others, you know, like the Indricotheres, which were rhino cousins that got very, very large, elephant sized. But when it comes to big mammals well they made it boring they they, they were right. all doing well, they, it they are very much like sauropods yes in the sense that they're not the only mammals that have gotten big lots have done it mammoths or about uh, mammoths etc proboscideans yeah. it was standard yeah this is this is what we're good at probus it's like uh what you're less than six tons pishaw and the straight tusked elephants some of the biggest ones. Paleoloxodon nemedicus is known as the Asian straight tusked elephant. This is late Pleistocene in Asia, all the way from India to Japan. This is potentially the largest mammal, land mammal ever. Potentially. Potentially. I believe that the, the big estimate for Paleoloxodon is based off of a single bone. Yes, it's one massive individual, yep. and it's an old individual. It's uh, uh, an estimated very late life. Mm-hmm. But estimates off of that individual have it at potentially 22 tons? 22 tons. And 17 feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> now, even if that estimate is a little high, it still is one of the biggest proboscideans. Oh, yeah. Even if you knock that down to a more reasonable average, that's still a big proboscidean. Yeah. And one of the biggest mammals ever to walk around. Yeah, that that size estimate, that sort of 15 to 20 ton range, Mm -hmm. that is peak land mammal. Yeah. And a number, a a few different proboscidean species have been estimated up in that range. That 15 to 20 ton, which is, now you're twice the size of a modern elephant. Yeah. That's... Huge. Now you're an oliphant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's proboscideans. That Elephants. We, we we went through as briskly as we could because there's a lot and we could talk. We could go and do a Dinotheer episode. We could do a Stegodon. Oh, absolutely. I'm Easily. sure there are people who are upset we didn't talk about elephant intelligence. Oh, no. Because how do you do that with ancient i mean yeah it's funny because a lot of the time when we're interpreting ancient elephants we are using modern social behaviors so yeah we're just kind of tra- uh, transferring them when you when you find a group of ancient mastodons or mammoths it's very common for people to assume they were a herd to mm-hmm. assume especially mammoths since they're so closely related to modern yes. elephants to say 
this looks like a group of females like modern elephants live mm-hmm, in. And that mm-hmm. might be like there was a study. I think this was the mammoth site where they were they did an analysis of all their mammoths and found that they were almost I think they were all males. Yeah. Like young males mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that were getting trapped and stuck here. And they said, well, these were probably bachelor males like modern elephants do. Yep. And so it's it's really easy to do that. And it's not necessarily incorrect. But there's a lot of different kind of proboscideans. So we can't assume they all act like the friendly Asian elephant just because they have tusks too. So there's a lot to be discussed about potential behavior. We didn't get into all the crazy communications that they're capable of. We didn't get into... Well, I, I didn't even just try to really touch on diet because that's, yeah. <laughs> we could have talked about that for each one 10 minutes easy. And so there's lots more here. And this is this is already a long discussion on proboscideans. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up our, our proboscidean talk. As always, if you want to hear more, let us know. Let us know. I'll, I'm going to put lots of pictures in the blog. I'm going to put lots of links too. I did not try to go through and, and name every single individual example and species that we, you know, briefly mentioned just because I didn't want to be throwing every name at you. So I'm going to put tons of links in our in the blog so that you can go through and, and look up all these individual proboscideans because there are tons of them. They're all cool. It's a cool group. Before we wrap up all the way, Patreon question. Yeah, we get questions from patrons. We get pe- questions from patrons at a certain level. You are allowed to submit one to us and we will answer it on this here podcast you can even submit more than one you can submit as many as you want we'll answer (laughs) them one one at a time regardless this question is from alexander who asks with wild american bison remaining fairly solitary what could we expect from them in the future This is a very interesting question. Yes, it is. And our answering it is hampered by the fact that we don't know nothing about bison. They've they've got horns. They're big. And they're big. They're like cows. You shouldn't get within 10 to 5 feet of them. Yeah, (laughs) you shouldn't get within like 200 feet of them. No. (laughs) But fortunately, we have a friend who studies bison. Absolutely. Like studies modern and fossil bison. So we emailed him. Jeff Martin says, in response to this, so the question's about wild American bison. And Jeff first points out that even public bison herds are managed at a high level and kept relatively contained. So wild is kind of a... A loose term. Yeah, a loose term with bison. But regardless, Jeff says of bison, wild... American bison bulls are only solitary seasonally. During autumn rut, they will reconnect with the whole herd. Whereas females are gregarious. They group. They herd together. The number of herds and the population as a whole are growing across North America. Yay! Which is great. There is a trend in the literature, Jeff says, that describes a phenomenon where larger grazing ungulates, that is hoofed animals, tend to be solitary... And smaller species tend to be gregarious, grouping, Mm -hmm. especially in the females of the populations. So bigger hoofed animals tend to stick it out on their own and smaller ones tend to group, which intuitively I think makes sense. You strengthen numbers. Absolutely. Like you, you need that when you're small, not so much when you're the size of a bison. Jeff continues, it has been hypothesized that the giant bison... And the Ice Age bison, these are two extinct species, Latifrons and Antiquus, may have been more solitary than the modern Plains bison, presumably because of their size. Yeah. Jeff says, with the climate changing, bison are expected to shrink. <laughs> and we hypothesize that. And when he says we hypothesize, he has linked to his a paper that he's on. So he and, and colleagues hypothesize, if the trends we see in other species can be applied to bison... That bison might, if they're becoming smaller, become more gregarious. Uh Heard more. Behaviors are famously difficult to predict, but perhaps bison will become more gregarious either with bulls remaining with the herd longer, even all year round, for protection from predators, or smaller herds of large... So you'll get these big central herds and then these small satellite herds. Yeah. Yeah. Those satellite herds might become less frequent, and they might all be sticking 
closer to the larger group, uh, which he says is similar to what caribou do. Because well, caribou, they... you get these oh, just massive herds. Conglomerations. So perhaps in the future, uh, we will see... So it sounds like, uh, in, in direct response to Alexander's question, solitary is conditional. So not all bison are being solitary, although you do see solitarity in males. But that might not stick around. Yeah. As the environment continues to change. Yeah. Which makes sense. So they might become more gregarious. We might see grouping of herds. Tiny little cute bison herding together, which you still shouldn't get close to. On islands. Yeah. <laughs> no, dwarf, dwarf bison. <laughs> but as Jeff pointed out, this is very hard to predict. Yes. Behavior is super hard to predict. So I th the easy answer is, uh, uh, who knows? Mm -hmm. But there are some ideas for you. Very cool. Well, thank you for the question, Alexander. Thanks. We learn stuff. Oh, I love the questions where I get to just email because we did this with the uh, we had a turtle question yep. recently. I like the questions where I get to go. I don't know. Hey, you. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Here. Well, and this is something and I think I don't know how often we have said this, but the reason that we do this podcast, every mm -hmm. episode is a new topic. Yes. And I worry sometimes that we come off looking like experts in each episode's topic. It was one of the questions we got when we presented at, at NAPC. At NAPC. We are not elephant experts. Ooh. We are no, I think there is there are two episodes of the podcast that I would consider us experts in the topic. Yeah, we we have not been And they're not the ones that you think they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't been experts in the topics for a very long time. No. So, the way we get our expertise allows us to find the information yes. and interpret it. And one of the cool things about being in our position is we know people who can answer these kinds of questions. Oh, the hedgehog question was one of those. Yeah. I fa I know a person who's obsessed with hedgehogs. <laughs> like, scientifically. And I was like, hey, hedgehogs. Yep. So, yeah, it's super fun. Which allows us to answer, que given prep time, it allows us to answer questions about all sorts of stuff. Well, it's, it's nice because through the podcast, we can directly connect some of our listeners and patrons to the people in academia. With with one degree of separation, yeah, which you don't usually get a chance to do. It's it's difficult for even us just to do it on a whim. Sometimes when we're just curious about something, we'll have to be like, all right, we'll have to remember to ask that person. Yeah, here we have an excuse to be like, hey, no, you need to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to hear? Uh, you've heard this, uh, the the saddest and cutest fact I know about elephants. Yes, go ahead. I think you've I think I've told you this I before, think so, but please. I'm going to tell the listeners. Yes. I visited an aquarium years ago. Uh, I think it was the Connecticut uh, Aquarium, Connecticut, and I wa They had a film showing about an elephant sanctuary mm -hmm. in Africa, mm -hmm. presumably, where the people who ran the sanctuary would go out and collect young elephants who had been orphaned because their parents usually had been killed by poachers. Yep, and they would bring the baby elephants back to the the big sanctuary, and there was all sorts of cool stuff like the older young elephants would take care of. Yeah. The new young elephants, yeah. and that was really cool. And they were showing how they take care of the baby elephants, and there's all these people around these baby elephants. And what I learned, what they said in the documentary, is that one of the things that they have to do while taking care of the baby elephants is put sunscreen on their little baby elephant ears, <laughs> which is adorable. The reason they have to put sunscreen on the orphan baby elephant ears is because the ears are super sensitive and they'll get sunburned. And when their parents are around, the babies stand in the shadow of their parents. Yeah. And when mom's not around, their ears get burned. Yeah. It's the saddest sunburn ever. It's... And this is coming from a redhead. <laughs> <laughs> it is It is the saddest. <laughs> I, I remember watching. I don't remember anything else yep. from this documentary. Yep. It's like, that is the saddest thing I've ever heard about elephants. Well, that goes from cute to sad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's adorable. Oh. oh. Yeah. And it's, now it's Oh, no. August 12th is World Elephant Day. Yeah. It's go, go love an elephant. <laughs> awesome, awesome animal. Uh, we could talk about, when it comes to elephant social behavior, we could talk about that all day. All oh, that's another episode. So if you want to hear about that kind of stuff, let us know. Use all the contact stuff in the the outro. We release episodes every fortnight. Thanks again to all of our people who suggested the episode. All 72 of them. All of you people are awesome. Check the blog for pictures Check and links, blog. as we said. And keep an ear out, if you're on Patreon, for the bonus news and all that good stuff. 
and we'll see you next time. Sign off phrase. Bum bum. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.